Hey, I'm Noble. Thanks for checking out the message today. I'm so thankful that you're here and we would love to connect with you. An easy way to do that is you can text River Connect one word to 97000. You can also go through our website and find out more about us and see what we have coming up. Lastly, if you'd like to give to the River Church, you can text an amount to 84321 or you can go to the giving tab at the top of the page. I just want to thank you for being with us today and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye now. This week we are continuing our series in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I want to say thank you so much to Elijah, our family director, last Sunday. I was out of town at, in Gaylord doing a wedding for a couple that I've known for the past couple of years, so it was great to be able to celebrate with them. So, But I know Elijah did a great job last Sunday um, talking about kind of a tough subject. And if you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you to listen to the, su- to listen to the message. The reality is, is, is we talked about a verse that can be very confusing, But it's hard to understand at times that there comes a time when we have to let God do the work in somebody else's life and simply love them. And it's not about giving up, but it's about discerning when a person is ready to hear the truth. And Elijah talks about, talked about that last week, that there's a point in time where you've said the truth, you've talked about the gospel, and that person isn't just ready to hear it yet, and it's time to give them to God, not just keep beating them over the head with the same message. It's time to love them, right? And God will give you opportunities. Um, we have to let the person go to God, and sometimes that's tough because that's one of our loved ones who we want so much to turn to the Lord. But I don't want to preach last week's lessons because Elijah, or last week's message because Elijah did a good job. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to move, keep moving on. But the reality of the Sermon on the Mount is that it is all about living for the kingdom of God. And living for the kingdom of God is a very, very different thing. It's a very different thing than what we see in the world around us. And that's the purpose of this entire sermon that we've looked at for the the past three falls. This is our fourth fall that we're wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount this this year. And Jesus is calling us to live for the kingdom. Renowned commentator and theologian N.T. Wright wrote this. The Sermon on the Mount is not, first and foremost, a private message for individuals to find salvation in Jesus, though, of course, it includes that in its wider reaches. Nor is it simply a great moral code, though it does, of course, contain some shining examples of great moral precepts. We learned about that in the, in the Beatitudes. It makes, sense, it makes the sense it does because it depends all through on Jesus' kingdom announcement and on the fact that Jesus himself was, through this announcement, summoning people to follow him in this new way of life, the kingdom way. The sermon is a challenge in particular to find a way of being Israel and over and against competing versions. There's alternative versions of Israel, agendas, mixtures of religion, economics, politics, laced with nationalism, exploitation, hypocrisy. And Jesus' teachings are not about just being nice. Sometimes we can take Jesus' teachings and go, oh, he just wants us to be nice people. Actually, if you know know something, the word nice, if I remember correctly, not even in the Bible. All right? It's not just about being a nice person and being nice to people so that God will reward us with with a kingdom place called heaven. That's not what Jesus is talking about. The sermon's rather the agenda for kingdom people who want to work for the kingdom. And the work of the kingdom is summed up pretty well in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor, the mourners, the meek, those hungering for justice, the merciful, pure-hearted, peacemakers, and the persecuted. They're not only blessed, but in in the middle of their vulnerability and weakness, they're the ones precisely through whom Jesus intends to bless other people. These sayings are about the type of people through whom Jesus intends to transform the world. And when God wants to change the world, I love what N.T. Wright says here. When God wants to change the world, he doesn't do do so through missiles. Instead, he sends the meek, the mourners, and the merciful. When God wants to put things right, he doesn't scramble combat jets. He calls people to love and do justice. Those are the kinds of people the blessings of God's reign begin to appear in the world. That's the Sermon on the Mount. That's what we've been talking about. And we are continually called to, to, to live in a different way. Jesus keeps calling us to live in a different way. We've talked about the plank in our eye a couple weeks ago. And if, before we judge a brother or sister, we got to get the log, the tree out of our eye before we take the speck out of somebody else's. And we got to point to the gospel continually for those that don't know him. Kingdom living is living the gospel. It's living out the gospel because we've been, show, we've been shown so much grace and mercy. And now we get to another passage of scripture that's been 
often misquoted, misapplied, misinterpreted in so many different ways. So take your Bibles and let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I realize your Bible might be a device, so pull out your device and go to Matthew chapter 7. It'll be on the screen behind me, but I always say every time we dig into God's Word, it's very, very important that you see this in God's Word because my opinion doesn't matter if it doesn't, if it doesn't rely upon the Word of God. And so you're not here to listen to a guy, you're here to hear from God's word. And so I want to make sure you see it in the Bible this morning. We're going to start in verse 7, Matthew chapter 7, verses 7, 11. And if you don't have um, a, a Bible app on your phone, you can always download the River Church app, and that'll give you everything that's in there. I do want to remind, actually, everybody, as a side note here real quick, if you're not catching the events that are happening at the River Church, we don't announce everything from the stage because otherwise we'd be here for like 20 minutes of announcements and ain't nobody got time for that, all right? But the reality is, is if you want to find out everything that's going on at the River Church, download the app. Get to the website. You've got to go check that out because there's a ton of stuff happening that we just don't have time to always announce here in our gatherings, all right? So be sure to download that. And, of course, when the River Church app, there's also a copy of the Bible in there. So I uh, want to make sure, again, that's there for you. So Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11 says this. Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks, asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So at first glance, you can imagine what the initial way of thinking is and what Jesus is saying here. I mean, if we take it in, at just at face value and not in context, in context, we'll say, ask, and it will be given to you, right? Okay, then, God, I would like $1 million, please. All right? I would like to be married. I've wanted to be married for a long time. I would like to have a house that isn't falling apart. That would be great. I'd like to have a marriage that isn't crumbling. I'd like to have a job that I don't hate. I would like the memories to go away. I would like to have friends. I'd like to not feel so depressed. I'd like my loved one to be healed. I would like to my loved one not have died. I mean, asking it will be given to you, right? Seek after it, you're going to find it. Knock and the door's going to be open, right? But does that actually happen? Is that how this works? There's so much in our lives that brings us so much pain and pleasure that we could ask for. And that is what Jesus is saying here, right? And see, out of this verse being taken out of context comes so much misunderstanding and incorrect theology. This is one of the main verses of the name it and claim it prosperity theology. I can go to God, I'm gonna name it, I'm gonna speak it into existence, I'm gonna keep praying for it, I'm gonna keep praying for it, I'm gonna keep praying for it, and I'm gonna get my bills paid. I'm gonna get that fly car I want. My drip is gonna be drippy, all right? Because I've got all kinds of cash flowing in because God told me so. It's incorrect theology. And yet if you take it at, 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 at just the context here, you can think that. Along with James 4.2, you hear that you desire and you do not have, so you murder, you covet, you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You don't, you don't have because you don't ask. Well, God, I'm asking for it. I want. And you fill in the blank. But then when it doesn't come, then what? When what we're asking for isn't provided, what happens then? I mean, it has happened for other people. Then we hear people say, oh, well, you didn't ask in enough faith. You're not a good enough Christian. You don't follow God. You, really, you say you are, well, you don't have what you want. You must not be following Jesus. It's your fault. That's really the only thing that can come out of this reasoning. It's either that or God lied to you. Or he isn't actually good. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying that we ask for whatever we want, we want we're going to get it. Because that would fly in contradiction to the rest of Scripture. So what, if that isn't what Jesus is saying here, what is he saying? A text without context is a pretext for stinking thinking. I'll say that again. A text without context is a pretext 
for stinking thinking, otherwise known as incorrect theology, incorrect interpretation. We can, you can take any verse you want out of the Bible and make it say what you want, but you've got to look at it within its context. What is Jesus talking about in the Sermon on the Mount? You can't just take this verse out and say, hey, I'm going to get all the other things I want. We have to look at it in the overall context that Jesus is speaking here. Let's think about what he's been saying. Again, I go back. He's talking about the kingdom of God. And this is what he's talked about. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You come to God, you must be poor in spirit. You must know you bring nothing to the table. You come needing desperately him. That's how you come to Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn over their sin. Those that are meek, those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. The merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. Those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Those who follow Jesus are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. And we are, be call, we are called to be the light of Jesus. This is the overall kingdom living. Be careful with your anger. Anger doesn't serve those that live for God's kingdom well. If you look at a man or a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery. Jesus has talked about this on, on this message. Divorce is something that God hates. And Jesus gives parameters for that in this message. He says, let your yes be yes and your no be no and don't take oaths. Don't be taking promises that you can't keep. In fact, don't, re don't retaliate against those that harm you. Don't retaliate. Leave that to God. In fact, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is kingdom living. Give to those that are in need around you. He taught us how to pray when he gave us the Lord's Prayer. And with prayer comes fasting. He talked about how we should fast. He tells us to put our treasures in heaven and not here on earth where everything can be corrupted. He says to cast all your anxiety upon God because he cares for you and that he holds you. Understand that he holds you and that he provides for you. Then he says, condemn not or you're going to be condemned. Take the log out of your eye before you try to get the speck out of somebody else's eye. He says, tell others about the gospel, but if they're not ready for it, go to somebody that does. This is kingdom living. How in the world do we live like that? How do we live like, how do we do all those things that Jesus is calling us to do? Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. We have to know the context that Jesus is talking about. Otherwise, we can pull that verse out and think it's saying a lot of different things. When he says, ask, and it will be given to you, it says, ask that God will give you the strength to live this way. I've just told you a bunch of things. Ask that you'll have the strength to live in this way. You understand that living this way will not come naturally. I talk about it a lot because it's something I struggle with, but when somebody cuts me off, I do not want to pray for the person. I don't. It's just not in my nature. And I'm still really bad at that. But we, right, we're not supposed, we're living a, called to live a different way. And how do we do it? We ask, and we have to understand it doesn't come naturally. We ask that God will give it to us, that it will help us live this way. We seek after it. And what do we do? We seek God's face in the middle of all of this. Because you want to live for the kingdom, and you don't know how. But when you seek him, you will find him when you seek him. You're putting action to your asking now. It's not just words. It's time to start putting action with it and thinking about what we're doing to live for the kingdom. And then finally, knock, and it will be opened. Don't give up when it doesn't come easily. Be persistent. Because God is continually working in your heart and in your life. This is what Jesus is saying here. You want to live for the kingdom of God? This is the way to do it. Ask, seek, and knock. And I want to tell you something. This right here is how you develop a deep and lasting relationship with Jesus Christ. This is it. Because he's actually saying more than just what the English language talks about. The New Testament was written in Greek, not in English. So there's different Greek words that are, that are used all throughout the original manuscripts, and we've translated it in English. Just a quick, for instance, if we say love in the New Testament, we say, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you have to look at the Greek to actually know what kind of love that we're talking about, because there's three words for love in the Greek language. There's agape, which is unconditional, phileo, which is brotherly, and eros, which is a sensual love. There's three different kinds of love. So if you're really going to understand what Jesus is saying, you've got to look at the Greek, right? You've got to go back to the context. 
Sometimes we have to do that. Don't get overwhelmed. There's plenty of Bible tools out there to help you do that. If you ever want to know what those are, I would love to talk to you. I, I geek out at some of that stuff. It's fun. But the same thing's happening here. The words that Jesus is using, ask, seek, knock, in the Greek are actually what's called imperatives. That's in the English language too. It's an imperative. It's a command. It's something that you're being told to do. It's an imperative. But there's two ways of imperative use in Greek. One is called the aorist, and the other one is the present. The aorist means that it's a one-time command, like take out the trash. That's a one-time command. Present tense means it continues. Take out the trash, and this is your continual responsibility. Take out the trash and keep taking out the trash. In this here, Jesus is using the present form of these imperatives. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Keep on doing it. We're continually called to do. And the reality is when we're asking for things, we can do this, right? If a loved one's in the hospital, man, we're going to ask and keep on asking. We're going to seek and keep on seeking. We're going to knock and keep on knocking, at least usually. But also maybe not. The Bible does tell us we have not because we ask not. We do need to take our requests to God and go with him with everything, though that isn't necessarily what Jesus is saying here. I am a firm believer in the fact that we as Christians do not pray big enough prayers. We don't. We're asking for tiddlywink stuff, for marbles, for, for kids' play. When God can take care of things that are larger and do things that are beyond our imagination, and we don't pray big enough prayers. I believe we should pray for healing. I believe we should pray for that loved one to change their life. I believe that we should pray for, resur for, for, for restoration and the resurrection of somebody who's ruining their life, that their dead life would come back because they've walked away from the Lord. God, we serve a God who raises up dead things. But all throughout the Bible, this is an ask, seek, and knock, and get whatever I want. It's within the will of God. Because his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And though that's not what Jesus is saying here, that is the totality of Scripture. We have to understand that God is not our cosmic genie in the sky. We go to rub the lamp and he pops out and goes, hey, hey we're going to take you wherever you want. Exit here, 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 everywhere, and take you away on a magic carpet. Not going to happen like the cartoon. It's within the will of God because he knows what's best for us. And what brings him glory. But I want to ask you a question this morning. Though there are times when things are dire, we keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Have you ever thought about doing that with your relationship to God? God, I need help in overcoming my anger. And I'm going to keep coming to you every single time I struggle. I'm going to ask and keep on, seek and keep on, knock and keep on because, God, I want to look more like you. God, I need to forgive because you've forgiven me. I know you want me to be more loving. God, I want to be in your word more. I want to go out and know how to go deeper with you. I want to live the kingdom life. The reality is, my friends, we pray prayers like that once and sit back and expect Jesus to just do it in our lives. When we do not break down the doors of heaven saying, God, we want you. Because in reality, we want a drip or two of God. We don't want all of him. And if we go back to Jeremiah, I'm going to quote this later on in the message, but you've got to understand something. You will seek God in Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek God and find him when you seek him with all of your heart. This is what Jesus is saying here. Ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. I mean, listen to Luke's account of the same thing that Jesus teaches in Luke 11, uh, 11, 5 to 10. And he said to them, which of you has a friend who will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, don't bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I can't give up and give you anything. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. Yet because of his impudence, or his continual knocking, 
He will rise and give him whatever he needs. Subtitle, to get him to shut up. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. I mean, if you're going to your next door neighbor and you are having a medical emergency in your house, for some reason you don't have any access to the internet or anything, you go to your friend's house, they may not be awake, but you're going to knock and knock and knock and knock and knock until they finally open the door and they're going to be like, what in the world's going on? It's two in the morning. But if you knock long enough, they'll come. It's also like Lassie coming up to you and barking incessantly and barking and barking and barking. You go, Lassie, Tommy fell in a well, right? Tommy fell in a well. Some of you got that one. <laughs> it's incessantly knocking and going after God. Not that he isn't willing to be found, but you know what I think God does in this process? I think he teaches us two things. I believe he teaches us where our reliance actually has to be. Because everything else is going to fail us. He never will. But he also has to teach us what it means to truly follow after and desire him. There have been moments in my life where God just, I say show up because it's my perspective, right? God never leaves us. I believe we have to be a little careful with the verbiage we use in life, right? I have really tried recently not to say, God, I ask that you would be with so-and-so as if he isn't already with them. Right? I'm trying to be a little more careful because the words that are coming out of my mouth are indicating some of the thoughts that I have. And I try to be careful with that, though I don't always succeed. It's not that God isn't always with you or that God just shows up. It's my perspective that I know God showed up. But we have to be so reliant upon him to begin to understand when he shows up in the moment, man, he's, he's done things immediately. But other times it's taken time and I don't always understand it. That's when we have to go back and do we trust the heart of God or not. We have to remember what's true, not what we feel. Our feelings are very, very valid, but they don't have to be based on truth. we got to go back to what truth is, that God loves us. He doesn't leave us or forsake us. He loves our loved ones more than us. He knows the problems that we're in the middle of. We're gonna, he wants to teach us because he's a good father. All of those things we have to go back to, but it means that we keep asking, we keep seeking, and we keep knocking because we want to know more of who he is. The commentator Lloyd-Jones says this, there are times of stock taking in life when we pause for a moment and say, life is moving on and I am moving on, but what progress am I making in this life and in this world? We begin to take stock of ourselves and say, I'm not living the Christian life as I should. I'm not as diligent in reading my Bible or in reading my Bible and being in prayer as I know I should be, and I'm going to change this. How many of you have done that at the beginning of the year? Don't have to raise a hand. But in reality, we've all done that at the beginning of the year. We have our New Year's resolutions, and three days later, I'm the worst Christian ever, right? That's how it goes. And we'll say, I see there is a higher level which I want to attain. I think I, I, that God's calling me to that. I want to get there. And we're, we're honest. We quite, we're sincere. We have every intention of doing it. And so during the first few days of this new year, we read the Bible regularly. We pray and we ask God for his blessing, but this happens to all of us. We soon begin to slack and we forget. At that the very moment we thought of reading or praying, something comes in quite out of the blue, as we say, something we never anticipated, and our whole scheme and program is upset. In a week or two, we find that we've entirely forgotten our excellent resolve, and this is what our Lord is concerned about. Because we don't ask we don't seek, we don't pray, or uh, knock continually. See, following Jesus and living for the kingdom requires us to keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. But I want you to know something. There's some really good news in this. Because if we stop there, we're like, well, now I just feel like I have to do more and be more and all this kind of... That's not what this is really about. Yes, God wants us to turn our attention toward him, and we do so in these things. But God is our Father. He's our Father. And in the coming verses, there's an argument that starts with the lesser 
and it goes to the greater. It's verses 9 to 11 of chapter 7 of Matthew, and he says this. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for a bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your father who is in heaven will give good gifts to those who ask him? See, God is our father, and guess what happens when we ask and keep on asking? Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. He actually gives us himself. He gives us himself. He doesn't make a mistake. He's going to meet you right in your time of need. And I say it often. I wish he was a little early sometimes, but I'm glad he's never late. It sure feels like it, though. There's times where it feels like, God, oh, man, I feel like I'm at the 11th hour here. What's going on? But I want to ask you this morning, are you aware that God is a good father? I realize that as soon as I start talking about a father, there's many of us in this room that have had dad issues. I am one. I struggle at times with thinking God is continually disappointed in me because I never heard positive anything positive from my dad. And I have to go back to the truth of what God says about me, not what I hear my dad saying from when I was young. I realize that when I say good father, that's hard for some of us to grasp. But try your best. Maybe you need to ask, seek, and knock about seeing God as your father. Maybe that's what you need to do. But he will give us what we need. There's times when it feels like God's distant. And there's times when our faith is tested. Do we actually believe what we say we believe? I don't believe God does that to us. It's our nature to get our eyes off of God in the easy times. When things are easy, man, it's easy to get our our eyes off of God. But then when the hard times come, where are our eyes set? They're not on God. And now we have to try to figure out how to get our eyes back on God. Because See what I mean? It's easy for us to stop looking, to stop asking, seeking, and knocking. But here's the thing. When you come to God, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you think you've gone, he always welcomes you back. In fact, according to the parable of the prodigal son, he's been waiting for you. And he will run to meet you. He's your father. He will give you good things. And then we go a little further in Luke's account. In verses 11 to 13, it says this. What father among you, it sounds a lot the same what Matthew said. If his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? It's not just the good things that Matthew quoted, that he he heard. Luke may be quoting the Sermon on the Mount, it may have been another sermon that he heard Jesus say, but he says the account, and Jesus spoke, he's going to give you the Holy Spirit. He's giving you himself. He gives us the Holy Spirit within us as a seal when we come to know him. And he dwells with us. And as we become more aware of that, we come to a deeper awareness of that. We want to continue asking. We want to continue seeking. And we want to continue knocking. The good things God wants to give us is is himself. And what greater good is there? And so as we walk out of here this morning, I want you to walk away with this. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking for God's mercy and grace, and you will receive him. You will receive him. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know how to pray, for we don't know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This Holy Spirit is present with you. When you come to know Jesus as your Savior, you are given all of him. You are given all of his spirit. Not half of it, not part of it, but all of it. 
and you learn how to follow him because you ask and you seek and you knock. And I love what Hunt said, who was another commentator. It's just so good. The result is we get more good gifts than we ever imagined. Our assurance is this. God will give us anything that is good for us spiritually, anything, if we keep asking him for it. If you do not yet have eternal life through Jesus Christ, you can be sure he will give it to you if you ask for it for all your heart. If you're a believer, but you're short on Christian graces, you gotta keep on praying. If you find yourself often lying, if you begin to ask, seek, and not, God will help you become a truth teller. If you're not generous, make a habit of passionate prayer and he will give you a generous spirit. If you're not kind, but persistently seek God for a kind spirit, he will give it to you. Just think what would happen if we prayed for these things in ourselves and for our brothers and our sisters as intensely as we pray for physical things to happen on this earth. The church would explode because a far greater proportion of its people would be living kingdom lives. Our pulpits would be filled with preachers of power. The mission fields would shrink as thousands more poured out into the harvest. Do we want the character of the kingdom of God in our lives through the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Then we have to do two things. First, again, this is the commentator. He's just good. Ask persistently. Ask persistently. Jesus says that we're to ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. We are to beg, beseech God constantly and passionately for spiritual blessing. Do we pray like that? At the same time, we should ask confidently. Everyone who asks this way receives and everyone who seeks like this finds and everyone who knocks and keeps knocking, the doors open to him. God will give us anything we ask for that is good for us spiritually. If we lack spirituality, this is a tough one. If we lack spirituality, it's our fault. As James says, you have not because you do not ask. My friends, God is not hidden from you. Even though there are times in life where he's hard to find. The reality is God didn't leave. We decided to turn away. We look to other things because there's shiny things in the world. There's things in moments that we think are gonna be more beneficial to us than what God is. And there's things that really draw us away. And then shame overtakes us and we don't even wanna run back to the arms of the one that forgave us and that wants to forgive us and restore us. We need to seek, we need to ask, ask, sorry, we need to ask, we need to seek and we need to knock. See, we aren't close to God when we're not doing those things. But remember who God is. See, we could stop there and go, well, I didn't ask, seek, or knock, so I guess, you know, I could feel convicted. But I want you to remember who this God is that is calling you to do this. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come to me and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 31 to 33. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. This is the God we serve. Romans 8, 38 and 37 to 39. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor rulers, Sorry, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I don't care what you've looked to. I don't know what else you've asked or seeked or knocked after. But when you come back to Jesus, whatever you've faced, We serve a God who says, I will make you more than a conqueror. 
I will help you overcome because I've called you to something greater. I've called you to myself. So ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking and it will be given to you. So keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking for God's grace and his mercy and you're gonna receive him. You're gonna receive him. Will you do that this morning? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. I thank you for how you love us and how you deal with us. You deal with us in ways that our sins just don't deserve. We don't deserve this love. We don't deserve this this ability to ask you for what we need, to seek you and and to find you and then to knock, that you would open the door at two, three o'clock in the morning because God, we want to be more like you and you'll give it to us. So God, I know in the room this size, there's people in here that have been in pain. And maybe they've been praying specifically about physical things or things that are that they've been struggling with, that they've been acting in, or that they've been trusting other than. God, I pray your spirit this morning would turn hearts to you. That Jesus, your truth would be louder than all of the lies and the noise that they've been hearing. And that they, maybe for the first time, maybe for the millionth time, maybe for the first time in a long time, would ask you to deliver them. And as they ask, I pray that they would begin to seek and begin to put some action behind that asking continually. And then that they would knock and keep knocking, trusting that you as a good father will meet them right where they are. Thank you for loving us the way you do. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who forgives us of our sin through the cross, through his death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, thank you. May we ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.